Saw is a film I had only seen about three times before reviewing it. As I said before, I'm not really into films like this, but my girlfriend really liked it at the time and she wanted me to watch it. I actually had to hold back laughter as I watched it with her, which I felt bad about, and later admitted that I wasn't fond of the film, but she was fine with that. I mean, we can't all like the same things. Later on, we were both able to laugh about the problems I saw in the film, and I thought that might make for a good review. So this was the first review I had done that was strictly for fun, and not born out of my having something to say, like with my reviews of the Matrix sequels or the Star Wars prequels. Saw is the kind of film that I think is harmless enough not to really need someone railing against it on any kind of principle like that. But it's really fun to talk about. I mean, so much of this film just doesn't hold up under scrutiny, and I'm told with this kind of film that doesn't always matter, and that's probably true, but I think it's funny nonetheless. If there's one thing I wish I had done differently in this review, it's the systematic repeating of You Can't Write to the screenwriter all the time. I got that from an episode of Hell's Kitchen I had seen around this time. Gordon says to a chef, Hey, come here, I want to tell you something. He pulls him in by the arm and yells in his ear, You can't cook! I thought that was funny at the time, but the Gordon Ramsay style of entertainment is something that I've kind of lost interest in. That kind of thing doesn't really entertain me anymore. Doing these reviews for as long as I have, in the format I have, I've come to realize that there are many different kinds of criticism, two of which I use primarily. Useful criticism and entertaining criticism. Useful criticism might be identifying a story problem or structure issue and suggesting what might fix it. Entertaining criticism would be the Gordon Ramsay example I gave. It may be funny to some, but not exactly useful. And I'm not saying you can never directly criticize a writer or director, but the thing I didn't know when doing this review is that this was actually the screenwriter's first screenplay. That especially makes me wish I had chosen my words differently. Saw has about as many problems as I would expect from a first-timer. It's not that he can't write, he had just never done it before. And considering that this movie, flawed though it may be, actually made a cultural impact his first time out, I'd say he did pretty well for himself. He should be really proud. But yeah, telling a first-timer you can't write over and over again, not particularly useful. And it's not something I would have done had I known he was a newbie. But I, for one, cannot take this movie seriously enough to even really get involved with the franchise. I know there have been a billion other Saw movies, but I haven't had the interest to see any of them. This is the only Saw film I've ever seen. I'm not exactly sure how this review holds up in the useful department since it was mainly poking fun, but this wasn't really for that. This was an entertainment review, and I at least thought it was funny. Going through it again, there were jokes I had forgotten about that made me crack up, which I hope isn't too egotistical of me. It made me laugh. I hope it makes you laugh. You know his words will get you farther than the film will ever go. Give him a moment of your time, he'll tell you what's wrong with the show. He knows what's good, what's bad, what's really bad. His face is just a sign. Say hello to Confused Matthew. There are two films that I get frequent requests to review. One is Saw, and the other is Hostel. Well, I'm not going to review Hostel. I'm not going to watch Hostel. Hostel is just a sick film that you can't watch for anything but sick reasons, but... I just thought Saw was stupid. I have no problem reviewing this thing. People who call this torture porn and the critics who condemn it for being sick and disturbing are actually giving this more credit than it ever deserved. This film is not depraved. This film is not sick. This film is not disturbing, grotesque, sickening, or perverse. It's just stupid. And of all the things that this film is not, it's also not scary. And guys, I'm a wuss bag. Everything scares me. One of my biggest fears from childhood is E.T. for God's sake. Oh God, get it off, get it off! <sighs> I was never interested or scared once during this entire film. Every attempt at horror, suspense, and grotesquerie just ends up falling flat and stupid. They shouldn't even have called this Saw. They should have just called it Traps, because that's all it is. Just a bunch of people that we don't know or care about fidgeting around in traps. So the film opens to a guy asleep in a bathtub. He gets out and finds another guy there with him. These two main characters are what I fondly refer to as the dangling carrots. 
the writers never make any effort to turn them or their situation into something that we can actually know, understand, or care about. We just watch them as they lead us from one situational scene to the next. Instead of creating a believable atmosphere of what people would do in a situation like this, these characters are just blab vehicles that explain the details to us like we're nine years old. Just watch as they boringly go through the motions. Where are we? I don't know. My chain won't come off. Mine also won't come off. My tape says play me. Mine does too. So much for first impressions. The two characters themselves are the first of many, many obvious setups in this film. We have the let's freak out abductee, and then the let's stay calm abductee. Gee, I wonder what this guy is going to do in the end. Eventually these two notice a tape recorder in the hand of a dead body on the floor. And here we have one of the first plot twists in the film. The killer, whoever he is, is omniscient. He knows exactly what the dangling carrots are going to do, how much time it will take them to do it, right up to the point where this little game he's playing will end just when he needs it to, not a moment more or less. The dangling carrots are only as resourceful as this film needs them to be, even when the odds are that real people, not just plot props, would have been faster at figuring out some things and slower at others. The killer knows that it will occur to them to pull the plug out of the bathtub, tie it to a shirt, and lasso the tape recorder out of the dead body's hand, all as if they had been rehearsing this the day before. Watching this scene, I often wonder what the killer would have done if these two were actually as unimaginative as any real person would have been. Well, it's been three hours, and I just can't figure out what to do now. Go for the tub. Hey, did you hear something? Go for the tub. Mm. Must have been one of these leaky pipes rusting. Oh, for God's sake. So eventually these two get the tape recorder just like they're supposed to and play the tapes. The first informs one dangling carrot that he may well die in this room. The second tells the other dangling carrot that his job in this whole thing is to kill the other guy before a certain time or his family will die and he will be left to rot. And cue the functional standard reactions. Oh God, what are we going to do, man? Um... Is it time for me to freak out yet? No? Oh, okay, okay. Um, we just need to hold it together, man. Just hold it together. So then these two think about some of the clues that were left on the tape. They eventually figure out that there is something hidden in the toilet. They take out a case that contains two saws and begin trying to cut themselves free from their chains. Lo and behold, they do not succeed. In fact, the kid's saw breaks and he throws a fit while the doctor, actually witnessing the kid's failure, still continues to try and cut through his. Eventually they figure out that the killer doesn't want them to cut through their chains, but through their feet. Then the scene somewhat unevenly switches from the dangling carrots trying to get out of their situation to the doctor narrating who he thinks the killer is. During this explanation, the writers work in a plot point that is supposed to be interesting and creative, but once again doesn't go anywhere but stupid. The point here is that technically the killer hasn't killed anyone since they have technically all killed themselves. Which just isn't true. The killer, whoever he is, has killed these people, personally and legally. But for his putting people in these little traps, they would still be alive. It doesn't matter if they died trying to get out of the traps, because they were only trying to get out because he put them there in the first place. The killer carries out his actions with malice and intent to kill, and whether it was the killer doing them in personally or not, this guy is going down for either murder or manslaughter. So let's have no more nonsense about how this guy technically hasn't killed anyone. Technically, he has. We then enter a flashback to where the doctor is working on a patient with a brain tumor. The doctor is called to his office and confronted by two police officers who ask him where he was last night between 11 and 1. The doctor asks why they want to know, and the police officers tell him that they want to ask him a few questions about it, and that it would be best to do it down at the station. Okay, so why did they ask him where he was last night first? Why not just bring him down to the station? Eventually, they do take him down to the station, and the doctor discovers that one of his own pen lights was found at the scene of one of the Jigsaw Killer's little traps. The doctor knows this is incriminating, but he hesitates about giving up his alibi because he's actually been with another woman last night. His own lawyer then advises him to give them his alibi now because no one's going to believe him later. 
Okay, believe him about what? The cops have nothing. They have a pen light. That means it could have been the doctor, or it could have been anyone else that works at that hospital. What the hell does he have to worry about? So get this. The doctor gives up his alibi, and the cops confirm that it checks out. But before they let him go, they ask him to stick around and listen to the testimony of the only person to ever survive the Jigsaw Killer's little traps. Why are they asking him to stick around and listen to this woman? For absolutely no reason. One of the officers tells him, maybe it'll trigger something. Well, what the hell is it supposed to trigger? If the doctor's alibi checks out and he wasn't at the scene of the crime, it means he has nothing to do with the case. This would be like if I was falsely accused of a bank robbery, but then they asked me to look at a lineup of possible suspects. What the hell good is that gonna do? But there really is only one possible explanation for why they are making him listen to this woman's testimony. So that the audience can see the flashback. Which brings me back again to one of the many problems I have with this film, the characters. There aren't any. The characters themselves are simply plot devices. They do whatever is required of them to simply show us things. This has been problem number one. Now we get into problem number two, the actual killings themselves. What's wrong with the killings? Several things. First, every single victim in this film is totally anonymous. We have no idea who these people are. It is impossible to care about a nameless body that's thrashing around like they're having a seizure. And that's problem number two, the way in which each killing is shot. For some reason, the director of this picture decided to speed up the camera during each and every death scene. I've been told that this film is gruesome in some way. Well, I wouldn't know if that was true or not. I could barely make out what was happening in the death scenes since they were all shot so fast. It's like half this film was shot in spazovision, like the director was just hyped up on too much candy or something. Not only does this make the scenes undiscernible, it also makes them look incredibly silly. Not nearly so silly, however, as the traps that are actually set up, and the way that the victims behave in them. But don't even get me started on all that. Welcome to part two. At this point in the film, we realize that no quote-unquote victim in this film is even a real person. They're just like the two morons in the bathroom. Nothing but props for the plot, as well as for making us feel exactly the way we're supposed to feel at any given moment. There's nothing organic about this experience. Nothing that makes us believe this is anything more than a director placing people on a set and telling them, do whatever you need to do to knee-jerk a reaction out of the audience. This is most prominently shown by the fact that at the beginning of each and every trap, the victims have to give off a contrived little scream. You must make your way through barbed wire. Ah! You must find the code without burning yourself to death. Ah! They may as well have just put up a little graphic and gone, eh? 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 This is what those in the business refer to as manipulation, and it's all over this film. In fact, there isn't a single element of this film that isn't manipulative in some way. Most especially problem number three. Probably the biggest problem of all, the killer. Throughout this whole pathetic excuse to show us people in traps, they try to thread together some kind of mystery as to who the killer is. And since this guy can't deliver anything in the way of talent or imagination, we naturally have scenes that try and convince us in one way or another that every character might be the killer. You can tell when these moments come, because when we're supposed to think a certain person is the killer, they suddenly start talking with the exact timing, meter, and inflections as the killer, even though we've never heard them do this before. So maybe he's the killer. Or maybe he's the killer. Maybe the killer is this door. When in fact, it doesn't matter who the killer is, and it never will. Not once, ever in this film. Furthermore, the scenes trying to supposedly give us clues as to who the killer is are all so obviously manipulative that the audience never has any motivation to try and figure it out because we know we're being misled. Another problem here is the supposed motivation slapped onto the killer to explain why he's doing this. He can't stand people who don't appreciate life. Though apparently, he doesn't even appreciate his enough to do anything with it but stick people in traps. But even more than that, 
How the fuck hell is putting people in these traps supposed to make them appreciate life in the first place? If I was stuck in one of these things and I managed to get out of it, I wouldn't appreciate life any more than I already do, I'd just be glad I wasn't in the trap anymore. And even if putting people in life-threatening situations would make them appreciate life more, why waste a lot of time and money making it so elaborate and purposefully ironic? You could get exactly the same result by having someone dangle these people over a balcony for a few minutes. Despite even the writer's poorest of efforts, the killer's motivations never become anything more than moving the plot along, stringing the audience along, and showing us more people in traps. So after a few flashbacks, the scene then returns to the two dummies in the room, who are again doing exactly what they're supposed to do in order to figure out just enough, but never quite enough to actually escape. Hey, how do I know you didn't put me here? Because I'm in the same situation you are. Nuh-uh, you have something I don't. You have information. Now either you tell me what's going on or I'll- Hey, hang on a second. First of all, I just spent 20 minutes of screen time telling you what's really going on. Second, if I know what's really going on, why on earth would I keep it from you? And why would I have given you the litany of the Jigsaw Killer at all? I probably just wouldn't have said anything. And even if I was keeping things from you, what's the urgency of me telling you all of a sudden? It's not like the information is going to get us out of these chains. I just really don't understand your motivations for this sudden out-of-character outburst. Shut up! Now if you don't start talking, I'll cut you with this glass. This very glass that I'm holding up to my face right now. Oh wait, this is a two-way mirror. Oh, really? Wow, well that was convenient. Sure is a lucky thing you just got pissed off and threatened to kill me out of the blue for no reason, or we may never have noticed that. You can't write! So then the film follows the tired, uneven, and boring formula of figure things out, cut to a flashback, figure things out, cut to a flashback. This flashback involves the last thing the doctor said to his daughter. The little girl is laying in bed when she sees a man in her room. Instead of screaming and frantically running into her parents' bedroom, she calmly and slowly walks to their room and very sedately states, There's a man in my room. Seeing this for the first time, I honestly wondered if they were trying to make the point that the girl was supposed to be possessed or hypnotized in some way. It wouldn't have surprised me at all after the shit in this film, but no, it's once again a hokey plot service. Can't have the man discovered after all. So after a moment with his daughter, the doctor leaves, and then finally, we see the guy from Lost, God loves you as he loved Jacob, hiding in the closet. So now that it doesn't matter if he's found there or not, the girl finally screams like she would have done in the first place. God, you can't write. Then for no reason, we are forced to watch these two being terrorized by the guy from Lost. He waves a gun in the face of the little girl and her mom, and congratulations, you've actually managed to make me feel uncomfortable in a scene but in the most basic way possible. Fictional or no, it isn't easy to watch a child in perilous situations, but this feeling is default and never rises above default. Putting aside the standard feelings of watching a terrorized little girl, the scene is actually really annoying. If you'll ever watch it again, listen to how friggin' noisy it is. It just gives me a headache. I'm also still trying to figure out why we needed to watch it in the first place. So from here, we then sidetrack into yet another plot thread slash flashback that doesn't go anywhere. Turns out the cop is watching the doctor's house because he has become obsessed with the Jigsaw Killer case and is convinced that the doctor is involved. Because of a pen light. Even though his alibi was airtight and there were other suspects he could have been obsessed with. In yet another flashback, we learn that the cop and his partner found out where the killer was hiding due to evidence discovered on the videotape. His partner asks, is it enough for a warrant? And the main cop replies, who said anything about a warrant? Actually, they did have enough for a warrant. There is no reason they wouldn't have bothered to get one, and no reason why they had to go by themselves, except to set up more meaningless plot threads in the film. You can't write. So the two cops eventually end up in a warehouse, where they discover the killer's odds and ends, and finally stumble upon another victim. The man silently pleads with them when all of a sudden they hear the killer coming up in an elevator. So since they know he's on their way, and they know they have the drop on him, the two cops position themselves on either side of the elevator, and when it arrives, they tackle the killer to the ground, slap the cuffs on him, and take him away. 
Oh no, I'm sorry. That's what someone who wasn't retarded would have done. These two hide in the warehouse and let the killer approach the victim, who now due to his proximity can easily use him as a hostage. From this point on, these two idiots deserve what happens to them. After waiting until the killer is right over the victim, the two finally come out and order the killer to get on his knees. But what do you know, he activates one of the slow acting traps, and the two have to either save this guy's life, or take the killer into custody. In an impressive display of incompetent police work, the main cop puts the guy on the floor and then stares at his partner, who tries to figure out the trap. He doesn't search the suspect, doesn't slap the cuffs on him, and doesn't even remove his convenient hood in a costume that looks like it's right out of Scooby-Doo, so that if he actually does get away, he'll at least have a face to identify. Where the hell did he get his badge, Toys R Us? They manage to rescue the victim, but the unsearched, unrestrained, and still anonymous killer whips out a blade and slashes the cop's throat. Then he takes off down a hall. The partner goes after him, but stumbles onto yet another trap and gets killed, leaving the Phantom of the Opera free to escape. So meanwhile, and god, this back and forth is really getting on my nerves, the two in the bathroom are trying to find a hidden X, which is a clue they were told is around here somewhere. All of a sudden, the kid tells him to turn off the lights. The light goes off, revealing an X on the wall, and the doctor bashes it in and finds a case containing a cell phone and a few cigarettes. A note inside the box tells the doctor that he can kill the kid by dabbing poisoned blood onto the end of a cigarette and giving it to him to smoke. He also discovers that the cell phone can only receive calls, it can't make them. The doctor asks the kid how he knew to shut off the lights, and after a bitter exchange, the kid reveals that he found a picture of the doctor's wife and daughter tied up in his wallet. The doctor asks, why didn't you show me this before? And with a look of concern for the doctor's feelings, the kid replies, I couldn't. That's right, he couldn't. Because the scene needed him to be sympathetic. Even though just a few scenes ago, he very unsympathetically threatened to kill the doctor with a shard of glass because the plot needed him to discover the two-way mirror. Have I mentioned you can't write? Welcome to part three. So the doctor's phone rings and the person on the other end is his daughter. She cries and whines for a minute before handing the phone over to his wife. Instead of asking how or where he is, she asks him if Adam is with him. He replies yes, and she informs him not to trust him or believe his lies. Now, I want to point out real quick that the wife has absolutely no idea that the doctor is being held captive right now, a fact that we will learn at the end of this film. So, what exactly made her think that Adam would be with him? A wizard only knows. So now that another red herring has been thrown at us in a way that makes absolutely no sense, Adam naturally starts talking like the killer all of a sudden. He explains that someone hired him to follow and photograph the doctor. Then we get another red herring thrown at us in a way that makes no sense by the reveal that it was the cop who had the doctor followed, because he still thinks he has something to do with the case. Because of a pen light. Adam did follow the doctor and discovered he was having an affair, which was his alibi in the first place, which the cop already knows. You can't write. Neither of these two plot points, Adam following him and the cop hiring him to do so, means anything at all to the film, but hey, we need this to be two hours long. So Adam is staring at one of the pictures he took when he suddenly realizes there is a strange man in the doctor's house. The doctor recognizes him as Zepp, a man that works at his hospital. We then cut to a scene of Zepp still mixing it up with the doctor's family. He leaves and then goes into the other room where we now see a bunch of control room equipment in the doctor's house. How the hell did he get all that stuff in his house? Was he hiding it in his ass? So then the two notice the clock, which slowly whittles down to the last tick. Their time is up and the guy from Lost ungags the wife and calls up the doctor. He wants her to tell him that he's out of time, which she does, but then reveals that she has freed herself and the two start struggling for the gun. Finally, she gets the gun away from him, and then we have a cliché of something getting her attention, which distracts her, and the two fight some more. The guy from Lost manages to get the gun, but the wife pulls out a pair of scissors and stabs him in the leg. While this causes him to drop to the ground, the mother races over and unties the girl without bothering to take the gun again. How the hell is untying the daughter more urgent than disarming the killer? So then the cop bursts into the door and the two begin shooting back and forth while the family escapes into the other room. Then the scene cuts to the cop and the guy from Lost in a chase scene. 
So meanwhile, we cut back to Adam and the doctor, who is distraught over what he heard on the phone. The phone rings again, but of course it's just out of reach, making it unable for him to answer it. Then we finally reach the obvious climax of these two characters. Oh no, what are we gonna do, man? Um... Is it, is it time for me to freak out yet? It is? Oh, oh, okay, uh, um... Uh, oh, I'm gonna freak out! Time to cut my foot off! Ah! Uh, ah! Uh. Now, who didn't see this coming right from the first frame? The composed one is the one that loses it in the end. What a hack move! So after cutting his foot off, he inches his way to a gun, loads it, and shoots at him. What the hell did he do that for? His only one explanation for this sudden out-of-control behavior is, My family needs me! Well, you knew that this whole time! Why didn't you flip out when you heard the tape saying your family might die? Or when you saw a picture of your family tied and gagged? Or when your family called you the first time? Oh, that's right, none of those scenes were the ending. This movie only needs you to flip out when that can be the climax. You can't write! Anyway, the guy from Lost eventually kills the cop and comes into the room. He tells the doctor that he's too late and is about to shoot him when Adam springs to life. Looks like he was just playing dead. After being shot. He smashes the guy's face with a toilet cover and the doctor crawls away looking for help. So now we finally figure out who was doing this the whole time. And it turns out that the killer is... Slash. That's right, Slash, from Guns N' Roses and Velvet Revolver, one of the greatest guitar players of our time. Isn't that a brilliant reveal? I mean, no one would have suspected Slash because he has nothing to do with this movie. Okay, obviously I'm joking. The real killer wasn't Slash, it was the guy on the floor. After all, no one would have suspected the guy on the floor because he has nothing to do with this movie. Guess what, guys? That's not a twist! That's just something we didn't have a fair shake at figuring out. In a series of flashbacks that don't add up to anything at all, we learn that the only reason the guy from Lost was doing this is because the killer infected him with a slow-acting poison and wouldn't give him the antidote unless he kidnapped and would potentially kill the doctor's family. He never said anything specifically about being creepy and dressing himself up in a sheet while doing it. I guess that was just some sort of a bonus. So the guy from Lost did agree to terrorize the family, even though he could have gone to any poison control center for help. Though maybe it just wouldn't have occurred to him to do that, considering he... works at a hospital. This is the most pathetic excuse for a twist ending I've seen in any film, because it's totally meaningless. It was the guy on the floor? Well, who's that? Oh, it was the guy in the hospital bed the doctor was working on. Okay, who's that? We still don't know who the killer is. He's just some guy that was in the background of the film the whole time. Finally, the killer tells Adam that the key to his shackle is in the bathtub. Then we get another flashback of the beginning of the film where Adam was squirming around too much, ripped out the plug, and the key went down the drain. Okay, so what would have happened if he didn't accidentally wrench it out of the bathtub? He would have just found the key, unlocked himself, and went home? Or was it part of this guy's plan to have the key go down the drain? Well, if so, why did he even tell Adam it was in there? And more importantly, who cares? Nothing in this film worked at all. Not the setups, not the characters, not the plot twists, not the horror, not the suspense, not the gore, not anything. This is the most amateur hack film I've seen in recent years. I'm still at a loss as to how this film was reported as a sick experience. Even the violence wasn't that bad. Everything gory was either shot too fast to make out or it was done with camera angles and cutaways. We don't actually see the doctor cutting through his foot, we just see reaction shots of it. We don't see the guy from Lost getting his head bashed in, we just see Adam do it. Hell, I don't even know why this deserved an R rating. Starship Troopers was more graphic than this. A lot more. This isn't a complaint by any means. I'm not saying the film would have been better if it was more graphic. What I'm saying is, even the selling point didn't work. No one should ever hate this film because it was sick. You should only hate it because it was stupid. 
I feel very safe in saying that this was the stupidest film I've ever seen in my life, and I've seen Geely the end.